you a movie star cat? Is this a movie star cat? The movie star cat? Yeah. It's a little Suki. My Suki kitty. Suki has heard this story before many times. He is really, he's an 18th century scholar. I moved to Dallas so that I could be near my family after I retired and during the time that I'm sort of still on the faculty at the University of Florida. And I wanted an urban environment. And the building that I live in now is a good example of mid-century modern. So it's, a, it's got a very famous history to it. There are a lot of historic communities that are actually in very urban environments like Georgetown and DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., or the French Quarter in New Orleans. I found it much more interesting. Usually the people in the historic districts are more interesting. They're more varied people. Uh, the city's infrastructure, even though maybe it's uh, older infrastructure with trees and things like that, and then, and then you can walk anywhere you want to. I love to walk in these areas, not have to take your car out every five minutes, and. I mean, I don't want to have antiquated plumbing or something like that, but, you know, you do have a more advantageous environment, I think. That is my grandfather, Roy Eugene Graham. When I was younger, I called him Grampy, and I remember how he took me around the world with him to see historic cities and ancient places. He taught me to love traveling, but he also taught me how history and community come together in real places, places that are sometimes forgotten or lost. The value of community ties in with, with history because the communities that I've been privileged to work with have been uh, unique, and they have, usually have their unique architecture, unique customs, uh, the idea of celebrating these particular kinds of things brings people together with a common bondage. Roy taught me to love history, and as a distinguished professor of architecture, he's been teaching for over 40 years in a field called historic preservation, where architects and historians try to save that sense of place and history that real communities need. I was from a very historic town, the oldest town in the, historic, in the Louisiana Purchase, older than New Orleans. Well, I had grown up around these historic buildings and things like that, so I was very interested in, in saving them. Actually, I had done really well in architectural history in college, and I really was fascinated with it because I had proficiency in art I, uh, and design. I uh, decided I would go into architecture. He's a leader in his field, and he's worked on projects as diverse as the Texas State Capitol in Austin and the Taj Mahal in India. But one of his biggest projects was restoring an entire colonial town at historic Williamsburg, Virginia, which is now a living history museum. Uh, that turned out really well because I spent a decade there and learned a lot about restoration and a lot about history. and. History to me has been always interesting. I've always liked the history part and that has been my sort of guiding light. Uh, later on I, gave, I became very involved in, in social issues that I, I ended up working on towns, historic towns and, and parts of towns uh, rather than actual buildings. One important thing about what I did in my, all my career is that I had a fix for um, the technical side of preservation plus the history degree, the master's in history, gave me a unique advantage of having been being able to meld those two disciplines together. So sometimes I worked as a pure technician and sometimes I worked as a as, a, as somewhat of a historian. I think it's the only theater that Frank Lloyd Wright ever designed and it was done at the exact same time that the the building that I live in. It's, it's smacks of 1950s uh, because everything is smaller scale and that's true of, Mark, of Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture to begin with.
there is something called preservation, which is keeping the building exactly like it is, as you found it. The changes in the building, the, the add-ons, changes in decor, you know, when, and, and preservation is, is really that. Restoration is taking the building back to uh, a certain period, repair it, uh, that kind of stuff. And then uh, reconstruction is where you don't have a building anymore. And what you might have, as we did in Williamsburg a lot, foundations, which indicate where the floor plan was, what the floor plan was. You would have to go back to things like drawings of the house that were made earlier, or photographs during the 19th and 20th century, and uh, written recordings and things like that in order to reconstruct it uh, the way it was. And it's usually done to a particular period. And that is the biggest challenge. And then also, with the theory of preservation, and one of the things that we used to talk to our students about was it's better to preserve than restore. It's better to, to restore than reconstruct. Um, I think one of my best projects uh, was Lunenburg. This was a delightful 18th century city, that pretty well intact, because it was such a pristine authentic city at the time and so I said you what you really need is a preservation plan. We came together with this this plan which is now called the Graham plan at uh, Lunenburg not not that it was all mine because it was a combination of all of our talents and it was pretty successful. I started emulating it in other parts of the world. Of course, Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Venezuela, uh, Colombia, did I say Panama, um, Costa Rica, Cuba, Puerto Rico, which is not another country, but I've been there, United Kingdom, Ireland, France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia Herzegovina, Macedonia, Germany, Sweden, Denmark, Switzerland, Belgium, Holland, Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Soviet Union, China, Sri Lanka. <laughs> I like to travel. I am a passionate traveler. I used to enjoy hiking a lot and I used to paint, but can't do that anymore. As far as retirement is concerned, I wanted to go back and teach some uh, like every other semester, um, but that hasn't happened yet, and and my, actually my health is not uh, good enough for me to do that, I, and, and that frustrates me because I always, I mean, I see what's going on in terms of preservation. I always want to be out there fighting for preservation and for the, you know, for historic districts and cities and things like that. Roy and I are heading to the 2013 National Preservation Conference, where he will be receiving the highest honor given in his field, a Lifetime Achievement Award for his leadership in preservation education. Well, may I, have, may I have everybody's attention? I have uh, the great honor and privilege to introduce uh, this year's James Marston Fitch Award winner, and that is Roy Graham. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, I've never met Roy until today, but I feel like because I was reading about him, I think I've known you pretty much all my career, you know? And uh, so let's give a round of applause for Roy. Come on up, Greg Roberts. Give a few words, and then we'll roast you after that. So, <laughs> so on behalf of the National Council for Preservation Education, please accept the Thank you so much. Well, come on up and 
put it up there. So anyway, thank you. I'll put it here. <laughs> well, I heard I was going to get an obelisk, and he said that I shouldn't put it in my lawn, on my lawn. <laughs> well, I live in a 20-story condominium now in downtown Dallas, and I don't think you have any problem. <laughs> but, you know, I can tell you, I, I've been away from the mainstream for just a little bit, and it doesn't take long for it to change. <laughs> Um, the reason I don't deserve this particular award is because the award really should go to the students. I have had some of the best students at the various universities that I taught at. And, and it, you know, when you, you all know this feeling that when you have students and they're responsive and then they turn you on and you're able to sort of turn them on and, and then you get into this frantic um, uh, ecstasy of preservation and all of this stuff, and it really does work that way. Roy is, uh, I think you maybe get to a place I could see in your life where you might get complacent. You feel like I've learned all I need to learn. This is my shtick. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with this. But Roy, unlike any student that I've worked with or even myself, I hope I can be like Roy. Is that he embraces all the new ideas all the new directions, all the new concepts. He's always looking ahead 20 years, not to what the past of preservation was. He understands it. You lived it. <laughs> <laughs> but he's always, he's always looking forward. And, um, and I've had uh, someone tell me early in my life, you want to find that person that you want to be that you want to emulate, right, as your mentor. And I've had some amazing mentors. I've been extremely fortunate in my uh, career. But I have to say, I don't know that I've had one quite as extraordinary as Roy. So thank you so much, Roy. I think that my legacy is going to be the, uh, through the students that I taught and associated with. I think I had uh, a great influence on several people through the universities that I taught in. And they are off doing things like, uh, you know, they are heads of programs with the National Trust and they're working in preservation and spreading it around. And I think uh, I'm most proud of that, really. Even though I've never been in one of Roy's classrooms, I've been a student of his all my life, and he has always been a great mentor to me. I couldn't be more proud of him, and I can't wait until our next adventure together. <laughs>